put me in a stew and call me dumpling. Welcome to the strange and deadly show. This is a podcast dedicated to the section three list, the selection of films related to Britain's video nasties. We pair. I was angry there. We pair up these films based on a theme and then discuss and review them for your and hopefully our entertainment. Don't happen that often. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, owned by Apple, Stitcher and via any good podcatcher. And you can find more information about us and the other shows we have available, including Lost in the Omniverse, oh, that's right, our show all about comic book movies on our network over at strangeanddeadly.com. No mess, no fuss. I'm not mucking about. It's me, Chris. I'm back with you again with my good friend, my co-host there. Tom, how are you, dear Tom? I'm good, I'm good. Looking forward to getting into Phase 2. Iron Man 3 is here. Oh. Oh, shit. Sorry. Hold on a minute. Wrong show, old boy. Are we doing the Strange and Deadly show again? Unfortunately so. The <laughs> fan, fan demand has called for it, Tom. We've got to come back and talk about this nonsense again. Okay, well, fine. Okay, we've got a couple of horror films then. Yeah, stick bloody Iron Man up your, up your jack seat, mate. We've got no time to talk about Iron Man here. We're going to talk about these fine cinematic masterpieces here on the Section 3 list. And that's right, we, we pretty much just turn up whenever we want now, don't we, Tom, and say, ha-ha, we surprised surprised you here we are that's right that's what we do but this time and and to be honest we're not even following the running order that we set out <laughs> 12 years ago when we started this podcast but um this time we've got a kind of aliens stroke norman j warren theme now i don't know about you but I, i've heard that name before i think he's a bit of a cult guy who has his own sort of following, but I don't know much about him, so this is a bit of an education to me. What about you? Well, Tom, I am a a font of knowledge about Norman J. Warren. Uh, actually, I'm not, but I've got a paragraph here that I copied off the internet, Good. and I'm going to tell you about it. Well, I didn't copy it, actually. I wrote it myself, but with information that was gleaned from the internet, because I'd sort of heard the name before. Mm but had never seen any of his work. I don't think so, anyway, unless I happened to see it in the midst of a of a dream, perhaps, when I was taking mushrooms. I've never done drugs, but I would like to think that I would need them in order to sit through most of this man's work. But who knows? But let me tell you a little bit about Norman J. Warren. So, old Warren, he was a British director, Tom, born in 1942, a year after you, mm. who came into a little bit of notice in the 70s and 80s thanks to his work in the exploitation genre. He began with a couple of softcore pornographic films before turning his attention to horror, which resulted in his two most famous films, Prey and Inseminoid. Similar to a fellow British director like Pete Walker, who did, you know, uh, House of Whipcords, um, Frightmare, I don't know if you ever saw Frightmare, uh, but with less class in the filmmaking, I would say, old Warren, he made his last feature film in 1987 with Bloody New Year. <laughs> Bloody New Year. Oh dear, I prefer the old one. Uh, <laughs> it was such a negative experience that Warren largely turned his back on filmmaking, though has recently returned with a couple of short films within the last few years. So he's sort of back to it. But I read an interview with him, actually, where he was discussing... Uh, these two films, I suppose, and a few of the mm. other ones. He also made a film called Terror, which I've not seen, but that seemed to be his favourite. I, I can't remember what website it was. I think it might have been Coming Soon. Right. net. I think that was it. But he had an interview there where he was just kind of discussing his work. And, and yeah, not somebody I'd ever really paid attention to before. But, you know, one of these films in particular, in fact, the, the first one we're going to cover, Prey, is very, very, very British, isn't it? And I guess... You know, coming off the back of the sort of the, the hammer horror scene that was going on at the time, moving into this direction where we, we've sort of seen the end of that, really. We were seeing the end of Hammer, the end of Amicus, and moving into a different era of, of horror filmmaking. Of course, when we get to the 80s, we then get to a film like Hellraiser, for example, where suddenly it looks like, even though it's a very British film in, in itself, or British in some ways, as I say a very British film, it was set in, in England, of course, but you had american actors in there we're then getting to you know i consider hellraiser to certainly be a different class of filmmaking compared to to, to these but uh, interesting that there was still british horror being made at this time by directors like this it's funny you should mention hellraiser because it was on my mind when we watched these i was thinking i wish i was watching hellraiser no i wasn't <laughs> but i think you can i think you can sort of see the lineage and you're right it's the aftermath of the hammer era there's still these very English trappings, but it was a time when British films just didn't have the money to compete anymore with what America was doing. But 
he was this guy, Norman J. Warren, doing his best to do it. And I think you've got to admire him for that and keeping the British film industry going in some small way, trying to broaden it and be as vicious and as visceral as the American stuff, but probably for a fraction of the money. Yeah, that's it. And there's actually an interesting fact here that I didn't know going into watching Inseminoid, which I'll tell you about when we when we get to that. But I do I do have admiration for directors like this, even though he came from you know the softcore scene, and so mm. you know Norman certainly these two films. I can't speak to his other stuff, but these two films, but there is a bit of a sleaze factor to them. It's 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 it permeates them to some degree. Uh, certainly, I think Prey has has quite a bit of that going on. But it also that was a British thing. Certainly through the through the early seventies to the mid seventies, we the Brits we we did like our soft core shenanigans, didn't we? Well, I think part of what we see in this, and um, you see it in a lot of British output of the time, and you also see it in things like Day of the Triffids. You know, a lot of the science fictiony type stuff. I mean, Day of the Triffids was, wasn't sleazy or, or grimy oh. in this same way, but I think it was almost challenging this perception people have of, you know, the British being this very genteel, very well-mannered people. But, <laughs> you know, on the surface it might appear that way, but under the surface they're, they're as debauched as and as sort of ravenous in their desires than anyone else, but they just keep a lid <laughs> on it. I, and yeah. I think you see that in in a lot of this type of output. That's right. The Brits, Tom, they're filthy fuckers. I don't like yeah. them. I don't like <laughs> them. But it's no, it's a funny thing. I mean, Tom, Day of the Triffids, they had Bush in there, but they didn't have Woman Bush. <laughs> and these are the kind of films where you might you might catch a, a glimpse of of your Bush bits there, Tom. Your Bush, I call them Bush bits. That's why I'm such a hit with the ladies. Uh, mm. I call them that. But you might have a chance to just you know, and especially if you're a young boy watching these films, which obviously. Uh, I was, you were, I think, middle-aged by the time this came out, Tom. The, you, you were looking at that thinking, oh, look, there's a bit of titillation going on there. And, of course, now we, we, we're in an age now where you can't, you're not allowed to be titillated by things. I do understand that. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't want to be titillated anymore, Tom. Uh, I'm afraid of it. But certainly looking at, at films like this, you know, yeah, you could have a bit of sleaze in there. But the production values, I think, is what... I think is what sells some of these films short. And we'll go into that as as we go through it. Certainly, they're, they're not going to... But when you look at something like Hellraiser, even though I suppose if you compare it to some of the big budget horrors like A Nightmare on Elm Street, it doesn't quite have that level of slickness to it. But you look at something like Hellraiser, and it does seem like it's another world of filmmaking compared to this. Mm, I don't know. I think it's just like... It, it, it is a higher quality, but I think it's it's along the same line. It's further along the line that these films were were setting out that's why hellraiser was very much in my mind at the time all right fair enough well why don't you dear thomas oh mm. it's just so good we're back in the horror mode tom mm. we're back in the horror mode now we stop talking about those goddamn men in tights we want to hear about that we want to talk about prey and i'd like you to tell me about prey the first of our norman j warren double bill tell me about prey tom i want to hear about prey i would be delighted to prey thank you released in 1977 also known as alien prey or the destructor directed by norman j warren and starring barry stokes barry stokes eh? oh yes there he is stoking the fire Barry's a good film star name, isn't it? Um, it is. And Sari Faulkner, and it goes like this. Kator lands in the English countryside. He's an alien being sent to acquire intelligence on the human species ahead of an invasion that will see them being used as a food source for his alien race. He attacks a young couple in the woods and using his shape-shifting abilities, takes over the body of the man. Taking his name Anderson, he heads off in pursuit of further intelligence. Meanwhile, Jessica and Josephine are living a relatively peaceful existence in a country mansion, though Jessica sees flashing lights on the night of Kato's arrival that she can't explain. Jessica owns the property, it having been passed down from her parents, and Josephine seems to have moved in some years later. The two ladies, who are also lovers, are enjoying a walk out in the woods when they happen upon Anderson. His leg has been injured from the earlier attack and Jessica takes pity on him, begging Josephine to let him come back to the house for treatment and rest. Josephine allows it, although she has a clear dislike of men and doesn't want Jessica to spend time with anyone except her. 
Back at the house, Jessica notices how strange Anderson is. He rarely speaks and doesn't seem to understand etiquette. Nevertheless, Josephine makes the out-of-character decision to let Anderson stay for dinner, though she believes Anderson to be an escapee from the local mental hospital. Jessica doesn't mind the extra company anyway, having felt bored of her existence with only Joe for company all this time. Meanwhile, Kator, as Anderson, hears on the radio that police are looking for the now missing couple and he heads out to the location of the abandoned car. He stalks and kills the policeman there and returns to the girls. Anderson is allowed to spend the night at the house. Jessica discovers a locked trunk that has some bloody clothes and a knife in it, making her suspicious that her male friend Simon, who used to visit, was perhaps hurt by Josephine. The ladies head off to bed and begin making love while Anderson walks around the house. He briefly observes them writhing together and then heads outside to radio to command, who advise him to stay and continue to gather information. The next day, Josephine finds the horrifying sight of her chickens mutilated in their pen. She suspects a fox, and so the three go out searching for it. Joe misses the shot when she sees it, but she and Jessica are surprised when Anderson turns up holding the fox, now dead, and places it on the table. The three decide to celebrate with a small party later that night. Since Anderson seems suspiciously like a blank canvas, Josephine decides to put a dress on him as well as lipstick. He drinks copious amounts of wine while the girls dance, although Joe is growing more and more jealous of Jessica and Anderson and their association together. Suspicion is also growing about Anderson's strange behaviour, specifically that he hasn't eaten anything since he arrived. The three decide to play a game of hide and seek which culminates in Joe brandishing a knife who says that it's clear Anderson captured the fox without the use of a trap. Tensions rise and Anderson says he will leave in the morning. Joe goes out with her knife to stalk Anderson and perhaps kill him, but she and Jessica later hear him yelling for help. He's in the midst of drowning and they manage to recover him. Returning to the house, Joe and Jessica continue to argue, with Jessica saying that she's finally had enough. She encounters her bird cage, the bird now missing. In anger, Josephine tells Anderson to leave and goes out to prepare a grave, especially for Jessica. It's clear this is something she's done before. Will Anderson help, or does he have a more sinister plan in mind for the girls? Joe? Mm -hmm. I think I'd like to go away for a while. We're going away in July. In September we'll be in Paris. I don't mean that. I mean by myself, just for a little while. No, Jessica. You can't risk it. Why? Look, we've been through this before. Can't you imagine that I might want to be with somebody else sometimes? There can be nobody else. But, Joe, we're not the only people in the world. Jessica, if you went away and allowed yourself to get screwed up, I might find somebody who could understand, who could share. No. No, I could never let that happen. Joe? Joe, listen! I don't want to discuss it. Who are you? What are you doing in there? This is private property. Anderson. A Anderson. My name is Anderson. I'm a stranger here. This is private property. This house, does it belong to you? Goodbye, Mr. Anderson. I'm sure you know the way out. He's hurt, Joe. Mr. Anderson. The man's limping. He was obviously just resting in the lodge. Can't we give him some water or something? All right. Mr. Anderson, would you like a drink? Have you had an accident? Can we help? Yes. Can't remember. My leg. Never mind. Come on back to the house and rest. Besides... It's a long time since we had a visitor. All right, Chris. Pray, what are we thinking about this one? Oh, yes, pray. Well, what an odd little duck this be, Tom. It's, uh, like I said towards the beginning of the show, it's a very, very British horror movie. And I sh it sh I sh we should say at the very beginning of this that the the version of this that Tom and I saw was pretty close to potato quality. <laughs> so that doesn't help, especially during the nighttime scenes where it's all pixely and horrible looking. And like I told Tom 
before I watched it. I'm not putting this on the 4K TV. Uh-huh. I didn't pay. I didn't pay nearly 500 pounds to stream this to a TV. Uh, so I'll put it on the iPad instead, where it's squashed down a bit, and hopefully get some enjoyment out of it. As far as the film itself, uh, I have to be honest. As a, a general overview, I found it pretty meandering, and there are so many different aspects of it that I can't. I couldn't quite work out why these things were happening particularly in respect to these two women who seem to be enjoying enjoying you know relatively happy life you know, Jessica who is the character there who's Canadian who had moved to England they never really sort of quite explain this completely we'll, we'll get into it as we go uh, I, I've spent the whole movie wondering why they invited this blank canvas of a man into their house in the first place and why they kept him around and that is something that baffled me throughout and I never really got over it you know as a as an overview of it I I thought it was like I say very British it I it, it had the feeling of a softcore porn to me throughout it but without much in the way of sex. I mean, you can't really get that much of a, out of a softcore porn anyway, unless you're young and you just need something to get your stiffy going. Uh, I don't need that influence anymore now, Tom, as we know I'm a good boy. But back yeah. then, certainly, I might have watched something like this and been like, oh, look, there's some boobies there. I will get the old Tommy Tucker out and have a go at that and see how we get on. And then I can always, if I'm finished and I haven't got any tissues left, I can wipe it on the curtains. There's a reason why I haven't opened my curtains since about 1992. But I'm not going to tell you that reason. You kind of figured it out. Uh, Prey is not a very good movie. The bones, perhaps, have a, have a good idea in there. But I have to say, I found it quite a meandering thing and it never really connected in the way that I was hoping it would. Uh, that's me. What about you as an overview of Prey? Well, I'll, I'll start with the why. Why did they take this weird guy into their home and feed him and offer him tea and not just tell him to get lost? Um, <laughs> yeah. It, it is a strange one. And I don't think the, the film particularly sells it that well as to why they've done that but I think as it goes on I begin to understand why a bit more but at that point (laughs) but at that point in the beginning it doesn't really make sense now the thing is as we go through the plot we see that Joe is actually um, very controlling of Mm. Jessica and while she might not realise it Jessica is as Anders Anders Anderson, good name, um, <laughs> says later on, she is like an animal trapped in a cage, and it's almost like she's like, oh look, someone else is here, someone else to kind of free me from this. But it, it's almost subconscious, you know what I mean? At that point, she's just happy to see someone else. So even though things aren't quite right, she's like, yes, come in, come in. So that that's my. Um, view on that and we will we'll we'll get into that a bit more but Hmm. as a general overview you're right early on it it was pretty meandering very slow but I have to say the longer the film went on the more engaged I was with it I actually really rate this one quite a bit I think it it's obviously very cheap and so on but the dynamics of the relationships for me that that really make it quite interesting. So I I quite like it. Right, there's something wrong with you, mate. There's something wrong with you that we need to diagnose, and we ain't got time to do it in this episode. But we got we got to figure something out because you know there's, there's some stuff you told me you found boring and you like this. It's it's it, it you know and you you shouldn't be judgmental about it. And I do understand that. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but. You know, they they paid three middle class people to run around a country mansion for a bit, and that's all. That's kind of all this is really. You know, I mean, it's. I mean, let's start at the beginning, and we'll see if we can work it out as we go along. Because I I need this to be therapeutic for me, hmm. because your choices when it comes to the stranger deadly sometimes they confuse me a little bit they confuse me but I I have to say I don't think this film is terrible I I must stress that before we get into the plot I don't think it's terrible or anything like that Um, it it is cheap certainly but anyway we've got this guy uh, Kator who comes down I think it's a good name for an alien I'd be happy with that I mean Mm. this this film pretty much is the British Morgan Mindy isn't it (laughs) in a lot of ways Kator comes down and he attacks this young couple 
uh, the guy is, you know, trying to get it on with a woman. And she says, no, that's the right thing to do, by the way. Uh, we're living in we're living in the Me Too time. Say no. Uh, I don't know why I'm giving you a PSA on that, but you just should say no. It's people like that. And luckily, he gets bloody chomped on by old Kator. Mm. And he turns and he takes over and becomes Anderson, who is the guy that he attacked. And the alien makeup, I don't think, is particularly great. I mean, they basically dressed him up to look like a, a Halloween cat and, you know, a cat-like nose and some sharp teeth. I never like I never liked the alien attacks in this. There's there's no substance to it at all. I don't think that's that part of it. It's funny you should say that. But you know, sometimes when you've got an image in your head from like childhood or something, you've seen an image somewhere and you don't know what it's from. That image of the alien, I've, I've uh-huh. seen it somewhere before, but just never known what it was from. And when this came on and I seen it, I was like, ah, yeah. oh, right, okay. So I'm glad it's it's I've watched it for that reason. It's great when that happens. It's like when I found that Indonesian martial arts movie that I was telling you about. Oh yeah, was it the year before last? Or it's something like that where you go, oh wait, that was that thing. Oh, I'm glad I found it. So mm. at least that's good, Tom. It, it, it you know it's um it means that this is because I know that this is now your new favorite film. So now that you now that you know that you can watch it, you can find it and watch it over and over again, uh, and enjoy it. Mm. Right, let's crack on. Um, <laughs> so we've got all that stuff with Kato at the beginning. He becomes Anderson. What do you think of that? What do you think of the guy who plays Anderson in this, Tom? It'd be interesting to see him in something else, wouldn't it? To see whether yeah. this is actually just his his acting range, or or whether he was just being very true to <laughs> to Kato as some blank canvas. You know, he's big. He looks strong. I think the biggest crime he commits in this is wearing a polo neck jumper the same colour as the trousers he was wearing at the time. You know, so it just looks like one big polo neck jumpsuit. You know, that is un- unforgivable. But I don't think he's a, he's a great actor by any means. He just sort of stands there looking blank a lot of the time. But I guess that's what he was there to do anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I did, you know, obviously looked him up quickly to see what else he'd been in. He's been in a few things. So it wasn't... Mm. I, I had the feeling I was going to click on his name on IMDb and it would just be this and it would be like, oh, OK, I understand it now. But uh, no, he he's... Like I say, blank canvas is the term that I've... I've used throughout it. That's all I really see. And maybe he, like you say, he was meant to play it that way. But he's not, he's a bit of a charisma vacuum. Uh, but mm. hey, I suppose if you're playing an alien, you know, I have to say, Tom, using the Mork and Mindy comparison, uh, old Mork came down. He was a he was a bag of personality, that boy. But you get this guy in. Where where's that? Where's he like, making all the funny noises and going ha 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 and all that? There was none of that there. Yeah, they missed a trick on that one. They missed a trick on making him more like <laughs> Mork. And I won't stand for it. So you get introduced to Jessica and Josephine there. Now, now one interesting aspect to this film that you don't see that often really in these kinds of kinds of movies is that these two ladies here they're in a lesbian relationship with each other, and mm. that's not and it is played relatively. It's not. I don't think it's played in a particularly exploitative way. What do you say about that? They have a sex scene, and apparently yeah. that was put in later on to to spice things up, or it was added to the script later on to spice things up to make it a bit more saleable. To say, well, look at this scene we've got in here. Check that out. It's hard to say really because I don't know whether I'm getting ahead of myself, but I, I read a bit about this film, and when you see what the sort of you know the academics and the the reviewers and things the the meaning they try to attach to it mm-hmm. you know you realize that it's a, it's all a load of old bollocks <laughs> you know not the film i just mean that obviously norman j warren i do genuinely believe he's a smart guy and i and i think he was working in this low budget arena but when you when you read him you know interviews with him and stuff he he really Seems to have a point of view and so on, but he was just working in this very low-budget exploitation arena. So I'm sure there's something to all this. But when you read what other people try to apply to it, you know, I read about, you know, one critic saying, well, this is all about, you know, the threats that males pose to females. It's about this, it's about that. And there's so many different points of view on it that you think, everyone's just projecting what they want it to be about really onto it and it's like is it really about that i don't know i mean yes it's unusual to have this lesbian relationship it's not the healthiest of lesbian relationships is it you know because Mm. joe is such a 
uh, controlling figure. She's already offed someone who she thought was a threat to her relationship with Jessica or actually got him out of the way so she could have a relationship with Jessica. Yeah. But that's part of what interests me about it. It, it is the relationships between them. And, and that's what I find kind of fascinating about it. Certainly, I, I like that aspect of it, that it's a, a lesbian relationship that is shown to be fraught with problems, specifically that Jessica is somebody who wants to be out of there, really. Uh, doesn't necessarily want to leave Josephine as such, but wants to have another, you know, to... She's talked about going to London, for example, to sort of get out, which I wouldn't recommend uh, having been someone who lives here. It's not as great <laughs> as you might think. But, you know, London is pretty rude. But uh, she wants, she just wants a more colourful life, really. And she's sort of being... I mean, there's no doubt about it that Josephine is incredibly possessive, like incredibly mm. possessive, unusually possessive, I would say. Uh, and there is an, a nefarious sort of quality to her that becomes more apparent as you go on. I mean, you were talking about how she off somebody off this guy Simon because Jessica makes a reference to this guy Simon who I guess was some guy who used to come around and visit them or yeah. visit Jessica more specifically and Josephine I, I, we find out later more or less has dispatched of him and has buried him somewhere and so I do like that aspect of it that we're seeing a different kind of relationship it's not just the guy and the girl it is a woman and a woman living together and trying to sort of trying to cohabit with each other but also at the same time having problems and showing that there is somebody who's kind of wearing the trousers in the relationship and not in a very healthy way. And then in comes this guy, Anderson. And I think one of the things that puts me off of this is the fact that old Barry Stoke Stoker, he, because he's such a blank canvas, I never quite see what Jessica sees in him, um, be it in a romantic way, there are certainly hints of it, or just be it in a you know there's all, there's that thing of of she's just looking for something new in life but if you're looking for an injection of color into your life i'm not sure that this is the guy to do it for you you know i don't see the appeal of it and especially even though i've you know i'm enjoying seeing these things being built up josephine being the controlling one jessica being the one who wants to live a different life and get away from it as soon as this guy comes in the question i have is why why would two smart women... I mean, Jessica, to me, seems like she's a little bit... You know, she's a bit of a kind of wilting flower, I suppose. She's a little bit precious and doesn't really know much of life outside of the country. Yeah. So I can understand maybe some there's an innocence about her that would, would mean she wouldn't perhaps pick up on these signs. Josephine seems to be... You know, we said it in the synopsis there, that she seems to have a dislike of men and seems to be wary of men. Why would they have this guy there? You know, he's not a particularly friendly guy based on, on his very nature, the fact that he's an alien who's a blank slate, essentially. Why would they have him? Why would they bring him over to the house in the first place? Why would they keep him at the house? Why do they let him have dinner? Why do they let him stay the night there? These are questions that I don't feel the film ever answers. I, I think it does answer them. Um, I think the overall theme of the thing is the answer, but it just doesn't really sell. You know, you need to get over that hump, don't you, of that initial, yes, come into our house, this is why. You know, if... If he maybe had a bit more about him and he had a bit of a cover story, oh yes, I'm new in the area, I need a job, yeah, you know, so or or whatever, just something to get him in there, have a reason to get him in there. I, I think the rest of it would have been a bit easier to swallow because you're right, you know, Jessica, I think is is very innocent, a bit naive, whereas Joe knows how to exploit that. And you're right, he comes in as this blank canvas and. Why does she gravitate to him so much? And I think the reason for that is is because deep down she, she probably does know that something's just not right here in this relationship with Joe. I, I'm not really being allowed to, to spread my wings a, as I should. And it's have you ever seen the, the Peter Sellers movie Being There? No, I haven't. Peter Sellers plays uh, Chauncey Gardner, I think his name is, and mm -hmm. he he's a very sort of simple man uh i think he's sort of got learning difficulties so he he just speaks in like three or four word sentences and often repeats back to people what they say and they, and they take on the meaning of that however they need it and so he'll he'll go to a politician's house and they'll say something to him and he'll 
he'll sort of either repeat it back to them or, uh, you know, speak about something just at random. And they'll be like, you know what? You're absolutely right. And, you know, and they will <laughs> sort of, they'll project what they need him to be saying onto him and take whatever meaning they can from that. And and I think this is a similar thing. It just didn't take much to upset this kind of control that Joe has over Jessica. And it just needed something else in that house for Jessica mm-hmm. to, to sort of gravitate to and project her own needs onto to go towards and Anders and and sort of latch onto him as and and I and I do believe it's very subconscious like get me out of here she doesn't say it in so many words until near the end but I think she's subconsciously saying to him get me out of here and she doesn't even realize that she's doing it <laughs> well, fair enough but I I would imagine Norman J Warren when he made this movie he sat and he thought right someday uh, a liver puddly and <laughs> The Liverpudlian host of a podcast based on a sci-fi TV show is going to sit there and really examine this and come up with the meaning of it, come up with the ideas, the subconscious level that exists beneath prey. The work of the work of a filmmaker who a few years beforehand was doing softcore porn flicks. I just I don't know if I see the intelligence you, you you're looking at. I don't know if I see it. I think that's barely subtext i think that is is exactly what's there i think the things that these people have wrote that i've read today about it being about uh you know the the sort of uh, vicious men you know uh mm. going into into women's lives and turning and blah 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 i i think that's too much but i don't think mm. that what i've said is particularly reaching I, I think that's just there that's the whole point of it you know later on anders says you're like an animal in a cage, you know. This mm. this this simple blank alien. He, even he can see that you're like an animal in a cage. She's got you trapped. So I don't. Yeah. I think it's barely subtext. It's it's just text, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I'm not saying that I don't see the point that you're making. I just I don't know if. And this is just a personal feeling. I, I don't know that I see the intelligence behind it that you're seeing, particularly. I I get the the point of the plot certainly I get the point of the the conflict in the relationship that exists between Jessica and Josephine the fact that she's very controlling and all the rest of it I think the key weakness is old Barry I think the key weakness is the fact that for so much of it he's this blank slate that mm. there's nothing there that projects that for me I get the the point of it but I don't get the power behind it I mean the way that you're speaking about it which you, you're very entitled to do so it, it makes it sound like it's like it's a powerful drama and to me what I'm seeing there is is more of a a meandering film that builds itself as a horror movie as a poster with which actually is a bit of a spoiler the poster is a as the the alien prey poster is a poster of him feasting on this young girl and there's blood everywhere and that's not the movie i see the movie i see is a bunch of english people in a house for you know it's not a very long movie either it's only about 70 minutes long or something it's not very long an hour and a quarter um that's what i see is a bunch of people walking around i i don't see the powerful horror movie that's in there that you seem to be seeing i have to say you know, another comparison to Hellraiser. And Hell- mm. Hellraiser is, you know, infinitely better. I'm not saying otherwise, but it's a similar thing. Predominantly, Hellraiser is about the relationships between, you know, Julia and Kirsty and uh, Frank and, and so on and so on. That in itself is quite kitchen sinky in a lot of mm. that type of stuff. And then you just have this element of horror thrown into it. Um, that that brings all this to the surface in a really horrific way. And I think this is similar in, in what it's doing. And I'll take on board what you're saying about old Barry Bethel, just <laughs> maybe they should have either tweaked his performance or maybe give him a little bit more character, like he was able to um, maybe be a bit sneaky or, or try and coerce his way in or, you know, just give him enough that, it wasn't so because it, it does seem kind of random, doesn't it? That they mm. they bounce off him in a particular way. 
But again, I, I buy it because for me, it's all about the, the need Jessica has for an escape. So even when this blank canvas walks into the house, he, you know, he's the lifeboat that she wants to jump on. But then why does Josephine, who's very protective, as we said, why does Josephine allow him to stay? That's something I don't understand. Why doesn't she call, you know, why doesn't she call the police on the guy, for example? Now, perhaps we can make an argument that she doesn't want to do that because she doesn't want suspicion to fall on her because she's done some bad things as well. But hmm. uh, why would Josephine allow him to stay? Because she's the one of the two who doesn't want Jessica to see anybody else. And it's also the fact that, you know, in sort of in tandem with that, the, the words you use there where they, they sort of bounce off of him but why he doesn't you know the moment that you mention when he they're, they're playing hide and seek later on in the film and he says well you're that animal in a cage to jessica and he's absolutely right it's a great point to have made but that's quite a distance you know down the line from when he first shows up what is he giving them for them to bounce off in the first place there's nothing there you know, I don't see anything there. All I can see in this situation is Josephine saying, get out of my house now or I'll call the police. Well, I mean, later on, Joe says that she's she's actually escaped from an asylum. So she, mm. she's probably not wanting to involve anyone else either. And, you know, I, I guess maybe you're right. She could have just been like, actually, mate, do one. You know, I don't want you around here <laughs> kind of thing. And, and that's a, I guess it, you either swallow it or, or you don't, that um, that they allow him to stay or not. It, I suppose it is problematic. Well, I mean, I suppose the argument that you could make in favour of it is that perhaps she always knew from the moment he stepped in the house that she was going to kill him eventually. You know, perhaps it was that. Of you know, there's another man who's around here. He might, you know, if we just leave him here, he might still poke around. He might come to the house at some point. So maybe I'll invite him in, and then see what we can do about it, and try and you know dispatch him later. It's possible that there was that that mm -hmm. would play into it. Because like you say, towards the end of the film, we then find out that she had escaped from a mental institute herself, and presumably had turned up with the family when they were still living there at the house. Yeah, so that yeah. that might be a way of excusing it. I mean, certainly, you know, I, I totally take on board what you're saying. I, I don't know that I see the intelligent subtext that you're seeing. What I am seeing is definitely a, a fairly well-structured relationship between the two of them there. But so much of that material, to me, it feels like, it feels like a, like it's trying to head towards being a powerful drama as opposed to a horror movie. And was that his intent? I don't. I mean, I don't know if I've read enough about Norman J. Warren to tell if that's the the case or not. Certainly, this is a guy who came from softcore porn, um, and that is the, the feeling I got throughout it with some of the music. Was that I'm what I'm kind of watching. This is how I felt anyway. I'm kind of watching a, a softcore porn movie, but without much in the way of porn. There's, there's like you said, there's a bit of nudity here and there. Uh, I'm kind of watching that, but without the sex in it, and it's meandering along, and occasionally your boy Barry you know, has a cat-like nose and jumps around for a bit and snarls. And that's about it. I d so I don't understand where, where the horror is coming from. I think that that's very much of the time, though. I mean, if you look at yeah. something like Don't Look Now, I think it was a Nick Roeg film, wasn't it? And that as well is very meandering. And, mm. you know, a, a lot of that is about the relationship between this man and the woman after they've lost their daughter. And that's billed as a horror movie as well. And And I think... That was very much just what what they would do at the time, and it would be a, about relationships, but have these sort of horror elements in it. And you know, I, I'm not going to come up with some kind of um, metaphor or, or whatever for this one because I've read so many today that I, I just I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to nail my colours to the mast with with yeah. just another one. But but I think that's what they would tend to do in those days, and, and a lot of horror movies of that time were quite meandering because Don't Look Now is virtually, there's hardly anything that happens until the end when you, have you seen it? I don't want to ruin the end. Yeah, yeah, I have, yeah. You uh, Don't worry about spoiling it, although you may want to put a little warning in in case somebody who's listening to this hasn't seen it, but uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't necessarily have to say what the end is, but, you know, case in point, it just goes through the whole film. There's virtually no horror in it, and then there's something that isn't even that horrific at the end, to be honest, but it is quite striking in its way. Yeah, um, so I just see it as, as of its time, really. I think that's totally fair enough. I mean, I think you've made incredibly good, you know, well-reasoned arguments about it. Uh, this is certainly the most we've... I think this might be the most we've debated a film on this, mm. on this show. And 
you know, it's for me, it's not a passionate debate because I don't, you know, I don't hate the movie or anything like that. Um, maybe I was looking for a certain vein of horror that I don't feel is here. Uh, and perhaps also looking for, I, I feel like the, I feel like horror some, sometimes is more effective when you you get a, you know a, a big strong sort of central character that the like Anderson could have been, which he isn't in this. But perhaps if he had been, I'm trying to think of an example that would make sense, like Eleven in Stranger Things. Mm. Uh, and obviously that's a very different kind of story. But the reason I'm applying it to this is because I think if you had you know, Barry playing somebody who was actually quite interesting, who perhaps was sympathetic to some degree, but at the same time had this thirst for doing what they needed to do. I think that might have been a more interesting plot point for me than this, you know, rather dull guy coming in and repeating a word now and again that they've said and, and you know, sort of strolling around. There's a believability aspect to it that I don't quite get. You know, when they when he's in the house the, the very first night and the girls go to bed and they're, they're making love and everything. Yeah, you know, I don't think I've ever been to a house in the country that didn't have the creakiest floorboards in the world. Uh-huh. And yet he's able to walk around that house, no trouble. And they don't, and the girls don't think, why is this guy, you know, because if, if I had a, a stranger in my house, which I wouldn't, staying the night, somebody who I'd only met that afternoon, wouldn't I be curious about why he's sort of walking around? Why is he always walking off into the woods and then coming back again? That if you if you want there to be a believable relationship in there, which this is kind of a believable relationship between Jessica and Josephine, you, surely you've got to have the, the rest of it believable as well and you've got to make decisions that make sense. I can't imagine... You know, unless you're you're a thrill seeker or something like that, I can't imagine two people inviting a guy like this into their house, letting him have free reign of the house. You know, letting him go, you know, go and come whenever he pleases for no apparent reason. It doesn't make sense, and it doesn't sort of fall in with the idea that these are intelligent women. Not to me, anyway. Certainly not Josephine, who seems to be in control of everything. If she's so in in control of Jessica's life, why is she letting this this element come into it? Unless she brought him in purposely to kill him. I think what it it comes down to is this, and this seems to be part of the great divide, is that Mm -hmm. I I agree that initially I was like, why are they doing it? Why are they letting this guy in? You know, he sits there, sort of snarls at their cup of tea for a bit, looks at their their budgie or whatever it is, like, what the hell is that? And just says very little. I agree that early on, it's, it's a jump. It's getting over that hump. But the more the movie went on and the the cracks in their relationship were exposed and he was sort of the lightning rod for it, it didn't take much to sort of nudge it. You know, it, it could have been anyone. Jessica just needed someone there to gravitate towards to and then Joe's behaviour would, would become more obvious. It And for me, that's all it needed. So the longer the film went on, the more I believed him being there. But I do agree that early on, it's like, no, why why would they let this guy in? You know, so I I think that's where the divide is. You either get over it or you don't. And if you don't, Mm -hmm. then you go through the whole film thinking, well, why is this happening? Because he shouldn't even be there in the first place. Well, I suppose I would say, because we should probably finish up on this point, because we've been debating that same point for quite a while. We need to sort of move through the plot but i'll just ask you this you said that the film provides you with an answer as to why he has to be there and certainly if you're looking at it as him being a lightning rod for the you know to kind of expose the cracks in their relationships relationship i do understand that that still to me doesn't provide an answer as to why they would allow him to be in the house or specifically i suppose josephine given the naivety that jessica um seems to show what what answer are you given that explains why he should be in the house beyond what it does to the relationship? I understand that that's a byproduct of him being in the house, but what answer does the film give you that explains why these two women would have this strange guy in their house? I'm curious as to what that answer would be. Because Jessica wants him there. She wants him there and she's very enthusiastic about him being there. And I think Mm -hmm. for Joe, I think she, she probably sees that and she's, if she's completely, off the rails, no, fuck off, you've got to get out of here, then that's potentially going to upset the apple cart with Jessica a bit. I mean, that's how I see it anyway, that Mm. she would rather kill the guy surreptitiously 
and and be able to say to Jessica, "Oh, he he left. He said, you know, thanks for everything, yeah. and I'll see you later." I I get where you're coming from. It's just not really a problem for me. I, I kind of once I've got over that initial hump, I, I just kind of go with it. So, do you think perhaps I'm overanalyzing it? It all depends. It's all perspective, isn't it? I mean, you said hmm. you thought I was overanalyzing it. This relationship kind of thing between them all. So I I guess. It's where you come from, but it, it's it's to me it's like it all comes down to that to that first kind of third of the film where he first turns up, and you either you either say yeah okay and then accept it because then for the rest of the film I I think it, it's it's fine, or if you don't then the rest of the film just stays as a problem. So I'm not saying you're overanalyzing it because. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it it's probably more of a gut feeling than anything else, isn't it? You sit there and you just think, this isn't right. Yeah, and I would also say that I don't think you're overanalyzing either. You know, when I said that um, about you, you know, perhaps looking at it a bit too closely and a bit too intelligently, well, part of that is also me making fun of you for liking a movie that I didn't expect you to like, to Bastard. be honest with you. So there is, yeah, ex- exactly, <laughs> exactly. I'll take that, I'll take that, I'll take that on board. But the thing is, you know, I don't quite see it as the intelligent drama. And I, I do feel like this airs on the side of perhaps being more of a drama than it is a horror. Mm. You know, only when he f- he has an occasional feast on people, which doesn't happen that often, uh, do I feel like it, it fits into the into the genre there. You know, to me, if you took Anderson out of it, it would just be a drama about a lesbian relationship and quite an interesting one. And maybe that would have been better. You know, if I'd gone into it knowing that that's what it was. But isn't Hellraiser that as well? You take the Cenobites out and it's just a family drama. It's the same thing. It it is, but at the same time, when the Cenobites do come in, and when you get Pinhead in and the box is open and all the rest of it, it adds a kind of law to it. Lore is an L O R E. Mm. It adds a law to it. There's an ancient history side to it. There's a you know, these denizens from hell have come down. There's a whole other story that is opened up, quite delicate at first, and then it just becomes this, this, you know, this um, act of extremity after extremity, one after the other, uh, which this doesn't have. It doesn't have that. This is, at, at its, you know, at its root, it's a drama that happens to have a couple of bits of horror in it. And like you say, there's a guy who comes in and then exposes the cracks in their relationship, whereas in Hellraiser... Once the family drama gets to a certain point, it then becomes a full-blown horror movie and it becomes, this is nightmarish, you know. Um, I don't see, you know, a similarity there at all. So I, I do see what you're saying in regards to, you know, the, the stuff with Julia and, and Frank and all the rest of it, you know, that you could possibly have a similarity there. Um but I, I, I do see them as, I see one as being, and I think you said when we began the review of this that you you see them as being along the same lines, not not quite in terms of quality, obviously, because mm. Hellraiser is, is jointly one of our favourite horror films. Yeah. Um, but you can see it around the same lines. I don't know if I do. I, I, I find this to be a drama that has moments of supposed horror. You know, I also think that if perhaps the effects had been a bit better, if you know the character of Anderson had been stronger... Because if you look at something like Hellraiser, even if you if you're absolutely right, even if you look at all the family drama stuff, when Pinhead comes in and the chains come in, you know, jutting through the skin and everything, that is really powerful. There's no power to the horror in this. I don't think so anyway. And what do you what do you think about that? I I would disagree on one scene um, because yeah, when, mm-hmm. when he gets his black eyes and you know his teeth and stuff like that, and they use it quite sparingly as if they know it, it's not the best. But, I mean, I, I watched this on my telly, and it wasn't the best quality, but I don't think there's any point in going through the plot any more than we already have. We've probably been talking about this for quite a while now. But, <laughs> we have, haven't we? Yeah. But I think at the end, when he's in bed with Jessica and, you know, he ha- has that really awkward, rough sex, um, mm-hmm. but then Joe walks in and he's been feeding on Jessica and he turns around and he's got you know, all the blood down his face and he's got his black eyes and his two... I thought that was a really striking image. Uh And I don't know whether it's because you watched it on your tablet or maybe you just didn't think it was that striking anyway, but I think think that alone really was quite a striking image. And, yeah, the rest of it, the horror wasn't that great, but leading up to that, I thought it was pretty great. 
Well, yeah, I have to say, I think I mentioned this earlier on, The there's a poster for this film that goes under the title of Alien Prey that is a massive mm. spoiler because it has him on it, Anderson, in that scene, and he's got Josephine there, and he's he's feasted on her. Yeah. And, like I said, it's a, it's a big spoiler, but that, to me, is a more striking image than what we actually see in the film, which is him having ripped her throat out. Uh, that's it, isn't it? As far as I remember, I don't think there's any more of a... Certainly, the violence that we see there is, is not to the extent that we saw in the poster. Um, I find that image to be more of a striking, you know, more of a striking look to it than, than what we saw in the film. I've seen the poster from the, from the video box. I mean, it is a picture from the film itself. I, they might have actually added a bit more blood to it. I don't know, but it, it is a photograph that in itself, I think, is quite a striking image, and that's what I saw in the film. So I quite liked it. Obviously, it doesn't seem to have worked for you as well, but that's a shame because I really did think it was good. Yeah, I wouldn't say I disliked the film, and this is this is one of those things. You know, I didn't have a have any sort of angry reaction to it or to it at all. I just, you know, I enjoyed bits of it. Certainly, some bits of the characterization of Josephine and Jessica I did enjoy, and enjoyed seeing a different kind of relationship to what we normally get in these films where. You know, apart from maybe the sex scenes, which, as you were saying, I, I didn't happen to read this, um, that they were added in later, which adds a bit of a salacious feel to it. You know, to me, I like the idea of just seeing this, you know, this lesbian relationship that happens to be malfunctioning a little bit. Mm. Um, I, I quite like that and the way that that was played. And it wasn't played. You know, one thing that annoyed it didn't annoy me when I was a kid, obviously, because I was young and I was, you know, looking for sexuality wherever I could find it. But certainly as an adult now I, I i dislike when a filmmaker will use you know some sort of girl on girl tryst as a way of exploiting the male fantasy and mm. i like the fact that this this didn't do that apart from like i say those those scenes which you like you say were perhaps added in later to try and put that across i like it i like the fact that it's a very different kind of relationship but it, it's not a very long film which I think helps it. I think if this was, you know, 90 minutes to two hours long, which some of these can get up there, I I don't know if you would be feeling the same way because I think it would have burned itself out because I, I find it a little bit meandering in where it's going and I don't know that the alien plot particularly works, you know. And again, this is just my, my opinion on it. I feel like if you were going to do it, you may as well just have taken the horror aspect out of it, made it a drama, had some guy turn up at the house who was perhaps, you know, you were mentioning there the Peter Sellers film, perhaps have someone there who's like a, a guy who has problems of some kind, who has some sort of, you know, retardation or whatever it may be. And he comes into the house and suddenly he's able to kind of, to sort of shine a light on these different relations. You know, Sling Blade was a little bit like that, uh, which is a great film, Sling Blade which again is about coming in this very, very strange guy who's a special needs guy who comes in, who's committed a crime, who's trying to get back into society. And as he meets this young boy, he, you know, their lives change forever as a result of him being in there for as briefly as he's there. Perhaps this would have worked better as a drama than as a horror film where I'm not getting, I'm not getting much of a horrific feeling from it. Uh, but I have to say, I, I, I've been swayed a little bit in, in terms of what you were saying about the intelligence of it, because I was saying that I didn't see the intellect in it. And the more that you've you put your point across to it, I, I'm seeing what you're saying about the subtext that's there. It's certainly not that I missed it. It's just that perhaps I went went into it expecting something um, different to, to what I got. And I think what I was looking for was an alien-based horror movie. And what I got was, you know, I th for me personally, I think Barry, perhaps, old Barry Stoker, <laughs> perhaps, is, is the... Uh, I think if, if if he'd been done better, I think maybe maybe I would be more on your side a little bit. As it is, you know, certainly no great dislike of this film whatsoever. It's not a film that sticks in my mind as, as any sort of great piece of work. But when I say great piece of work, that implies that I'm looking for, that I'm a cineast and I'm looking for a masterpiece. You know, when I watch a film like this that's a bit cheap, I'm looking for something that's going to keep me coming back to it and i don't know that a malfunctioning relationship like this you know is is going to entertain me on a on a sunday night but that's just me i mean what about you to to wrap it up on your side of it i mean you say meander and for me to a point i felt the same and i was sitting there thinking oh mm. god what am i doing here i've got to sit here for an hour and or whatever to watch this but the more it went on the more i was gripped and um 
it's it is interesting it it's been one of the most div- i don't think we've had one as divisive as this since pigs no. um, <laughs> but um you know that's that's what it's all about I, I suppose to to be able to do that and have those conversations and to so many people out there who just can't stand someone disagreeing with them and at the end of the <laughs> yeah. day who cares you know what i mean it, it can still be civil i'm never going to speak to you again after this but um yeah, good, good. <laughs> It's a strong film for me. And I'm not even sure strong is the word, but it was unexpectedly interesting and quite compelling in those relationships between the people. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. Whether that translates to me actually watching it again, I'm not too sure. But in the in the scheme of things going through the Section 3 list, it was a pleasant little surprise, I think. I mean, we've seen far worse than this, mm. you know. Film, you know, films like Wrong Way. I can't even remember the titles of most of the ones that we've seen that we really didn't like. Mm. And this certainly is not is not in a didn't. It's not in, even in a didn't like category for me. It's more sort of in the middle of that, really, of a kind of, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know. But what this is how you do it, folks. This is how you have a discussion without shouting at people and trying to pull them apart you know i mean when i do say oh tom i don't understand you and all the rest of it you know that is me playing and making fun but you know you can't get that upset about somebody's opinion on a film you shouldn't because as much as we love film and we both do and you folks listening out there as much as you love cinema uh it's a it's a it's a small thing in the grand scheme of of things to be mad about in life. Definitely getting upset because somebody disagrees with you on a film. It's such a tiny thing, and we've had you know a couple of people. One in particular, I won't I won't go in, uh, say any more than that really on it specifics. But we've had one person who really got upset with us because we didn't like a film they liked, and it's like, listen, man, you, you've gotta you gotta grow up. <laughs> Get some perspective. Get some perspective because, you know, there are a million things that have happened in your and my life and probably the people listening to this that are way more important than somebody's opinion on a film. You know, if, if I say to Tom, I really like this film and he says, well, I didn't like it, you know, and probably vice versa, you're like, that's absolutely fine. You try to understand their opinion. And as long as it's said to you in a way that is constructive, that's all that matters. You know, now I do prod at Tom and make fun of him and everything, but, um, you know, that's banter that's not because i actually legitimately want him to feel bad that he has that opinion because that's a stupid way to live your life over a film and anything really over a film a game a book uh you know a, an album don't get mad i don't know why i'm saying this as if it's a psa for people but you know it does it's you know i have listened to shows where people get really mad if you have an opinion that differs to theirs and it's like you, you you shouldn't be having that opinion. Just enjoy your film or don't enjoy it, depending on which way you swing, and let other people feel the same way about the thing. You, you know, you shouldn't be coming in and trying to pull people apart because that annoys me. And if you annoy me, I won't speak to you anymore. I'll put you on mute and I'll uh, block you on Facebook and you'll never hear from me again and I'll never hear from you. All right, Tom? All right. So if people want to get hold of this device of film, how are they going to get it? <laughs> Well, Tom, you're going to be first in line, buddy. You're going to be first in line for uh, uh, Vinegar Syndrome. Old Vinegar Syndrome is releasing a restored Blu-ray of Prey on February 27th, 2018. The Blu-ray will also be packed alongside a DVD as a separate release. The Blu-ray disc itself is region free. I've actually got a, a release from Vinegar Syndrome up there, which is Christmas Evil. Um, and that was region free as well. So it seems like they do that for most of their stuff. Um, doesn't seem to be another release of prey in the uk after the vhs came out and i think i had to look on amazon and it was like uh, like 100 pounds or something 150 pounds for the vhs so it doesn't look like it ever had a dvd release here the vinegar uh, vinegar syndrome release looks like the best opportunity to acquire acquire it if you so desire now tom this is this is kind of me poking fun at you a little bit here and i'll say this and then we'll leave it here but you are in my eyes, notorious for saying that you, you really like to film on this. And then when I ask if you're going to buy a copy of it, you never ask. <laughs> and um, it's the same way with pigs. It, I think there was one or two others um, prior to this that, that he said, oh, you know, I, I really was gripped by this. And you've never owned a copy of it. Uh, to be fair, you and I are um, making a move pretty soon towards going to more of an old digital life. So I can excuse you on that. But is this something that you would buy a copy of and watch again? I'll be curious to see it in a more cleaned up version, but yeah. but probably not. Because 
I, I think the older I get, I mean, I've made the mistake of going through life just hoovering up. For, oh, I like that film. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'll buy it. I like that film. And I think the older I get, the more I realize that there are films that I like and I've got what I need from them and I'll move on. And there's films that I like that become part of, you know, my life from then on. And I've got better at making that distinction the older I get. You know, so it doesn't mean that I haven't enjoyed it, but it's just I don't need to own it. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Being a bit more selective about it. And I'll leave it on this last point, really. For all of my, you know, making fun of Tom, the I've bought, and I'm, I'm not saying this is a bad film, I'm saying I've bought many films that if Tom, if you knew about them or if I found a copy of it, you would look at me and think, Chris, what are you on about? <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm sure I've got a feeling after this episode arrives, there are going to be a lot more people ticking the old box in the Tom Elliott fan club. But uh, I'm, you know, I'm guilty of, of sometimes liking stuff that people would look at and think, why did you like that? So, you know, it's only in the name of fun. But yeah, that's our our thoughts on Prey, dear Tom. Well, I do wonder where this next one's going to go then. So why don't you tell us about Inseminoid? I will certainly do that, sir. In Seminoid, released in 1981, uh, also known as Doom Seeds. I like that name. And Horror Planet. Doom Seeds sounds like um, the ch- the seeds that are in Gore Blimey's chili <laughs> that he grows in his garden. Uh, Doom Seeds, there. You have some of those, you'll be fighting for Britain, I bet. Horror Planet is his toilet the next day. <laughs> That's absolutely right. I'd love to go in there. I'd love to go in there and fart in his toilet. <laughs> Uh, but I don't know why I want that. Uh, of course, this was directed by Norman J. Warren, old Norman, Tom's best friend, uh, starring Judy. Now, is that Jason or Geeson? Oh, I don't know. I think it's, I'm going to say Jason, and if I'm incorrect, don't tweet me about it. Robin Clark is there as well. Jennifer Ashley, Stephanie Beecham, everyone knows Stephanie Beecham, uh, Stephen Greaves, Barry Hewton, Rosalind Lloyd, Victoria Tennant and more. And I'm going to read you the synopsis of this one right now. A team of scientists has landed on a mysterious planet once believed to have housed an ancient alien civilization. They've discovered an underground network within a tomb there and plan to excavate it. Two members of the team begin exploring the tomb until an explosion knocks one of them into a coma. Bringing him back to the med bay, the doctor finds in the unconscious scientist's hand a selection of crystals which are carefully poured into a container for further study. It's decided that they'll all remain on the planet to continue their work, realising they might never get the chance to return. Their research on the drawings and symbols found inside the tomb indicates that the planet was once ruled over by twins prior to the collapse of its society. The crystals tap into a chemical intelligence on the planet via the energy source that surrounds them. Ricky, the other scientist in the tomb when the explosion went off, begins experiencing fever-like symptoms which soon turn to madness as he runs around attacking the others. He slips into an environmental suit made to handle the toxic atmosphere outside and exits. Gail, one of the female scientists, goes out to try and work back around and seal the airlock doors to prevent Ricky from opening them and allowing the unbreathable air into the unit where the others remain. Ricky attacks her and runs off. The attack leaves Gail's leg stuck in the panel flooring. Her temperature begins to drop as it's revealed that the gauge on her suit isn't working. In a frenzied state, she attempts to sever her foot with a portable chainsaw but freezes to death in the process. Kate Frost, ironic name, uh, charged with documenting, I didn't see that until just now, Uh, she's charged with documenting the entire excavation, ventures out to complete the mission and finds Gail dead. She is attacked by Ricky but shoots him dead with her gun and returns to safety. Having buried Gail and Ricky, the team resumes their work. Mitch and Sandy head out to collect more crystals and are attacked by a monster. Mitch is killed and Sandy is impregnated with slimy alien eggs before waking up seemingly in safety with the rest of the team. She has a round hole where a needle was inserted during her abduction but seems relatively okay though this doesn't last long. The crystals held by the scientists are reacting to the presence within Sandy as they did with Ricky and it soon drives her mad. Her strength is increased tenfold, allowing her to overpower the others. She soon starts killing them, gradually losing control of her own mind. The pain increases as she heads towards labour, but still she persists and kills team member Barbara with a pair of scissors. The remaining scientists decide to hide in the operations room while considering their options. They decide to venture out to find Sandy, hoping to sedate her. The plan goes horribly wrong, and team leader Holly is killed alongside the Doctor. 
Whittled down to just a few now, the survivors can do little except hear Sandy's screams echoing through the corridors. She's close to giving birth, but to what? She's calling for Mark, her lover, to come and find her. The new plan is for Mark to talk with Sandy via the intercom, giving Kate and Gary time to grab chainsaws to help take her down. Gary dies soon afterwards when he discovers that Sandy can breathe the outside air even without a suit and she shoots him before removing his helmet, watching him suffocate as she tears at his flesh. In despair, Mark heads out and prepares explosions in a final dash at hope. This is Report 105 from Zeno Archaeological Expedition, Team 7. Documentation Officer Kate Carson reporting. The past two months of survey and research have resulted in the discovery of a vast tomb-like complex. This structure was unmentioned in any report made by the previous and abandoned expedition to this planet. Entry to the tomb has now been made, and examination of the inner chambers may reveal vital information about the extinction of the previous race that inhabited this planet. Despite the planet's two suns, the surface temperature remains a constant 89 degrees below zero. However, life support systems and electrical installations in the underground headquarters are fully operational. Safety factor, 60%. Conditions, tolerable. So, Tom, here we go. We have Inseminoid, otherwise known as Norman J. Warren's alien. Yeah. Uh, how, how are you feeling about Inseminoid, dear boy? Well, there is um, there is a bit of a gag about old Doctor Who, you know, the, well, 60s, 70s, 80s one, 80s especially, and 70s, I suppose, that it is just people running around corridors, and this was the overwhelming kind of thing for me, because it starts off, and I was thinking, okay, yeah, you know, obviously it is an alien rip, although I've read something to today where Norman J. Warren says, no, no, it was never meant to be, but of course he's going to say that. Um, yeah. And I thought, oh, it looks okay, you know, the shadows and down in the caves or whatever. But as soon as the light, lights come on, you know, you realise what they're working with here. And um, it, it does kind of descend into people running around corridors for me with, with not really much in the way of genuine excitement. And, I, and I'll get more into that later with, with some examples and so on. You know, I could watch it. It didn't get a, a particularly negative reaction for me, but I just found it pretty bland, nothing really gripping about it. You know, unintentionally funny in a few areas, but, you know, not not that great for me. What about you? Well, it, it's interesting. Uh, to go to the point that you were saying there about uh, your boy there, uh, Norman J. Warren, he, I, I was reading an interview where the interviewer actually said, well, this obviously, uh, and Timberland obviously is a, is a big rip-off of Alien, or am I wrong about that? And Norman J. Warren was immediately like, you're wrong. <laughs> and um, he his excuse for that was that they were shooting it just after Alien came out. Um, so they were they were in the process of shooting it, and his the other excuse was that he got some executives from 20th Century Fox to watch it, and they said no, it's not a rip off. <laughs> which is I don't know that's a particularly great explanation, <laughs> but you know, and I have to say that when we say rip off, when I first got the film, I had a quick skip through it just to check out the quality of the picture and all the rest of it, and uh, I the little bits that I saw, I was like, oh, this is a hundred percent ripping off Alien. Mm. There's another film actually around that was released around this time. It was an Italian horror film called Contamination. Oh yeah, yeah, and that you know that one, yeah, and that actually has what looks to be one of the face hugger eggs on the front <laughs> cover of it. You know, we have to be honest about it. Alien was a huge influence on horror filmmakers when it came out mm. everywhere, and there's no doubt about it. So when you watch something like this, you realise the skill that went into making a film like that. You know, uh, for, I'll give you an example. The, the music in this, the music in Alien is really subtle and dark and menacing when it's there and it's little, bang, 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 like it's really sort of quiet and and disturbing. The music in it, there's a couple of, there's a couple of bits in this where the music sounds like it's come from an episode of Seinfeld. It's like, it's like, and it, it really doesn't suit the mood of it. I have to say, I, I really enjoyed the first sort of section of it 
really up until the paper mache alien comes into it you know mm. once you start getting and then you realize oh of course they didn't have very much money did they when they make this and that all starts to become apparent because i i tend to think i mean look i'm not a filmmaker but i would i would like to think if you're going to make a low budget alien film or, or whatever you, you know keep, try and keep your, your alien in the shadows a bit because if, as soon as you put them in the light you're gonna start to see the joins mm. and i think that's a problem here it's like, i was sort of enjoying it up until we get you know the, the, our first glimpse at the monster alien that's in this whatever the thing is we never see it again yeah and it's just and it the the scene where it uh, it's attacking the two scientists there sandy and the other guy um, it's just so sort of clumsily done and, and cut quite badly and the thing doesn't look great to begin with. And that's when you start to go, oh, yeah, th- this is just a, a really cheap, inferior version of Alien. But I have to say, I was enjoying the atmosphere of it at the very beginning because I do like that idea of people being, and you know, we see it in The Thing, for example, of course, the original Alien, people being isolated mm. and you know, and not being within their normal environment and not being able to escape. You know, it's one of the horrible things about some of the Alien versus Predator movies, specifically the second one, uh, AVB2, was when they brought the alien to Earth and they're running around on Earth with the alien and the Predator. But that's not as scary because you've got, you can go places and you can hide somewhere. Whereas if you're on a spacecraft, and that's one of the great things about the first Alien, is, you know, Ripley is up there and eventually she's on on her own and she doesn't know where this thing is. And it looks great to start with. Um, she doesn't know where this thing is. It can blend in with the architecture of the ship. It's a frightening thing. This, it, it never really got there. Um, it's interesting because it, it, it's got a bunch of fairly well-known British actors in this. You know, you've got Stephanie Beecham there, who's been in a whole bunch of stuff. You know, she was, I think she was in Dynasty, which my mum used to watch. Amanda Amanda Reyes from Made for TV Mayhem will know many of these actors, I'm sure. I think the British, I mean, let's talk a little bit about the cast before we delve some more into the plot. How are you feeling about the cast in general? For me, the uh, Judy Geeson, who played Sandy, was a real standout here. I thought that she was able to kind of communicate the torture and the pain of that character. Uh, the... American lady who plays Holly, who's the, I guess the the leader of the team, not so much. Uh, did was not very good. I mean, how are you feeling about the cast? Was um, Judy Geeson was she the one who turned out to be the killer? Yes. Right. Okay. I'll be honest, mate. That that was one of the big downfalls for me. That mm. no one really had any character to them, any any personality. It was just all people. It was it was so earnest and serious and British like uh, prey. Yeah. So I, I read one review that said, you know, it, it could have used a bit of humour in it. Um, and yeah. I, I'm not saying it should be hilarious or anything like that. But when you've got an alien that looks so ridiculous and that first attack scene that you talked about where you just see, like, you know, a hand coming in, I, I think they did <laughs> try and hide it a little bit at first. But, but it, even keeping it in the shadows couldn't hide the ridiculousness of it. You know, you either go with a ridiculous movie with a bit of humour and blood flying everywhere or you'd make Alien, you know. Yeah. I don't know. The, the cast just... I don't I don't think there was many sort of distinguishing features between each character. They were all just very blank and very earnest and very serious. And that was that, really. I mean, Stephanie Beecham, I think she was in the Colbys... Um, which was a dynasty spin-off. I remember that from when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I used to have a bit of a crush on her when I was a kid. I thought you were going to say the thing that I was going to say, which is I read an interview that she'd done concerning this film, and she said she took this the role in this film solely for money. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can no see that. No other reason. Yeah, there's no other reason she was in this. She doesn't care about the film, doesn't like the film, thought it was an awful experience, all the rest of it, but did it so that it could, it could, you know, pay her way in life. I think she had kids or whatever it was and she needed money. So that was the only reason she did it. I do think that Judy Geeson is the standout in this, playing Sandy, who ends up being the one who is the inseminoid or whatever. If if that is the inseminoid, I don't know if the inseminoid is the is the alien or whether it's just a, um, a hint at the kind of process, the abduction process that goes on. But I think she's the standout because yeah, she screams her head off in this quite a lot. She has to convey, I think, the the pain of the the torture that's going on because, as we say, when that attack happens, she's taken, then she's abducted, and it's really strange scene where 
um, the, your paper mache alien, which again really works against it because you got your your model alien doesn't look great, but he's between her legs and sort of inserts this tube and this green, slimy, gunky nastiness comes down that tube. Yeah, I mean, has he got a big glass dong or something? Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, I think that's what he's got. Son. Okay, it's uh, but it, but you know, it keeps its shape mm. nicely, which is which is what we're all looking for when we have sex. Because when you go limp, it's no fun. No, uh, he doesn't. He doesn't have that. He doesn't have that problem, Tom. I'm getting head. I'm getting so excited about telling you about his cock that uh, I'm I'm tripping over. But he doesn't have that problem because his cock is made of glass. Mm. And so the alien eggs go in, Bing bang bong, you've got a normally inside your ovaries. Mm. So once that happens. She, you know, she, and quite what I quite like is that it shows that her sort of, she's getting wounds on her head and she's experiencing some pain as this thing has taken over her body. And I have to, I quite like her performance in this. The rest of it, it is running around corridors, isn't it? And I yeah. think that's, it's yeah. running around corridors from a, from a paper mache, you know, you've got a paper mache presence there, although you don't see any alien life again until much later on. And you've got a human that you have to be convinced is has been possessed by something. I suppose, in a in a strange way, echoes something like Event Horizon, which is I'm not a huge fan of that film, but it, it is, you know, it's better than this. But I suppose that there's a little bit an echo of that in this. Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because we get the alien and then he's gone and you're right. We don't see any more aliens until the end when we get the two little sock puppets. But... I mean, you said you like her. I I found it to be just nothing. Uh, it, this sort of nothing at the centre of it. Um, right. It was like, you know, your mum's mate Sharon, who she goes and does a bit of shopping with every Wednesday and has a cup of tea with, and then, you know, she's running around in this baggy white jumper, not particularly threatening. I I'm not, I don't know what they could have done with her. You know, I'm not saying they should have made a vamp up or something but you know she's no Claire Higgins that's for sure um mm. and she's running around the the violence is laughable in, in terms yeah. of the, the fights you know they barely touch each other or they punch past each other there's one moment where a guy fires a fire extinguisher in her face but it misses her face but she still goes <laughs> It was like it was like in the naked gun when someone threw a pillow at Leslie Nielsen's face and he, he just grips it to his face and goes. Ah! <laughs> so I just I just didn't feel the threat from this woman at all. Um, and, and when I mean, would we feel it in a in a film of this caliber anyway? I don't know, but it just, it just wasn't splatterific or or fun enough really to to really get anything from. Well, what I was going to say was that everybody in this film is useless. <laughs> everybody in this film has a chance to do something to this woman, mm. Sandy, and nobody ever does. They can't land. I'm not in favour of hitting women, but we, she's been taken over by an alien. They don't manage to land a hit on her. They don't manage to shoot her with anything. The the one time that somebody hits her, like you say, and even then, <laughs> even then, it's a misaligned shot. <laughs> but it's the the flamethrower thing. Nobody nobody gets a chance to do anything to her until the very end of the movie. It's a strange thing. Everybody in this film seems incapable, incapable of anything that would help the situation. The best one was when she was lying on the floor. She got knocked over for some reason, and one guy just sort of goes over and kicks her in the stomach <laughs> twice, just sort of stomps on her belly a couple of times. You know, they don't even know what the score is at this point. You know, she could be genuinely pregnant or something, and she's just went a bit nuts. I don't know, but um, he just stomps on her belly a couple of times and then runs away. Yeah, and there's also the fact that they know that there's a crazed person that's running around this station there, they they're all holed up in one place and they commit the one of the big sins in horror which is to send people out on their own <laughs> and they do that time and time again with like what are we going to do about sandy i know i'll go out there and do something and of course they end up dead oh that guy's dead what are we going to do about that i'll tell you what i'll go out there and cause a distraction it's not working mm. it's not working you should probably give up the plan now but they keep doing that until they're mostly whittled down um yeah, it's not great, is it? They probably have been. I mean, Italy loved their ripoffs. Yeah, the the Italians loved their ripoffs. There were probably. I mean, I didn't particularly love Contamination either, to be honest. But 
I, th- I remember it being slightly better than this, if not great in itself. There, there must be a better Alien ripoff than this, though, because this is pretty dour for most of it. I, I wish... I just wish the atmosphere had been kept up a bit and I wish they had a better monster in it because I think I think the key thing is you have to be afraid of the thing you know when I watch alien I am afraid of that thing because I realize if I was in you know an isolated location with that thing I would be terrified I'm not so sure I'm going to be terrified by this big big eyed paper mache thing uh, it's just not quite the same thing and then also a crazed woman who I mean she's got we understand that she's got increased strength because of you know she's been possessed by this alien being whatever it is um but you know nobody like i say until the very end of the movie where she's strangled to death by mark uh who's who was her lover early on because they have a, a little love scene of sorts you remember when he goes down this is very early in the film he goes down to check out the lights mm. in in one of the one of the rooms there and she meets him there and then like two seconds later they hug him with their clothes off <laughs> and that's like that that's the bit of titillation that you get in this if you're seeking it yeah um it just doesn't come together, really. It now they didn't have a lot of money when they made it. It was made for just under a million pounds, so they did have a lot of money to put something like this together. And I think that the cheapness of it definitely shows. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when when a film like this is so earnest and so serious, I think it. If you can't do, if you can't make it horrific and a bit scary i guess or or whatever or make the violence have some impact then it, it probably needs to be a bit fun or a bit campy or a bit silly but this was just so earnest and it just didn't follow through on the violence or the the threat or the scares or what have you so unfortunately but you know saying that it wasn't offensive to watch you can sit and watch it and and not be too bored by it but yeah, wasn't wasn't a good one for me. Yeah, again, it doesn't you know sit in the dislike camp at all. It's just they tried something and they failed to execute it really, and that's that's the reality of it. it didn't seem like Norman J. Warren was ever really able to to kind of make the film he wanted to make. I don't know that much about him really, but this certainly is not. You know, this is not. It, it's compared to Alien all the time, which unfortunately. You know, once you make a film that has got similar plot elements to it, and it's obviously, I mean, for the um, the character that Stephanie Beecham plays, people have pointed out, I didn't really think about it, actually, to be honest, until I read it, is that she is dressed remarkably similar to Ripley yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. in the movie. Like her hair is similar, her suit, because Ripley wears that blue suit, doesn't she? Yeah. In Alien. So she is dressed remarkably similar to her, uh, but Alien, this ain't. No. Uh, and I was going to say, this ain't, up there with aliens either, but as we know, Tom, not a big fan of that one. Didn't like it's better than aliens. Oh, God, what's wrong with you? Honestly, I don't I don't understand you. But that's all right, Tom. That's all right. You're from up north. We've learned to talk about you. <laughs> Let's not uh, but start it, that it is... <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Let's pull the old text messages out and go over those. Um, so, yeah, it's... Yeah, it don't really work for me, I have to be honest with you, Tom. The, the, the only thing that stands out in this to me and this is going into Christopher's martial arts and geekery is that at the very beginning of this film uh the beginning credits of it it says presented or uh presented by uh Run Run Shaw and Run Run Shaw is what is one of the Shaw brothers and Shaw brothers is a studio in Hong Kong that produced Oh God! Probably over a thousand films, maybe, maybe even more than that, um, and many of which were martial arts movies, and some of which were horror. So they did sort of br- get into horror a little bit, but it just strikes me as really odd because because Shaw Brothers released a bunch of horror movies, and some of them were really, really weird. It just, I just wonder what what Run Run Shaw saw in this because he he apparently put up half of the money for it, so he gave them like five hundred thousand. Wow! Why? <laughs> why now to be fair you know Shaw Brothers made some fantastic movies they also made some bad ones because if you're putting out over a thousand films they're not all going to be great I'm afraid no. and there are a lot of bad ones in there as well but it's not a great choice is it no I, I can only think maybe it was the alien thing that 
that came out. I'm not sure how far apart they were. A couple of years, yeah. This came out in 81, so it would have been... Alien was, what, 79? Right, okay. Maybe that was it. He thought, that, okay, I want a slice of the alien pie, and he thought this was going to be it. All I can say is, uh, I love you. Run, run, sure, I love you, but run your ass on out of here <laughs> with your... your your damn injection of cash that produces it's i don't think it's a it's you know a terrible film it's just a really lackluster thing no matter what norman j warren says i see a lot of alien in this and and none of the good stuff so you know if you're gonna do alien try and do it a bit better you know for me the the thing of i mean i love aliens as well but for me in having a a movie a, a really quiet suspenseful horror movie where it's just isolation, one thing against another thing that's much more dangerous than them. I don't think Alien can be beaten for that. I love Alien, and this this ain't no Alien. I've never really understood the rip-off culture kind of thing, and I'm sure there's films that I like in that vein. Um, But, you know, studios like The Asylum, when you get a big blockbuster come out and they make, like, a really shit sort of version of it, you know, or, or slightly removed from it, why Why would I want to watch that? I'll just watch the good one, thanks. You know, I've never really understood it. And I'm sure there's probably some Italian knockoffs that I do actually like, but, um, yeah, it's a bit of a weird one. Yeah, it's strange. I mean, Asylum will do that thing where, like, a Transformers film will come out and then they'll release Transmorphers. Yeah, yeah. Where it's like, we've taken a bit of the title and they're going to change it to something else. And it's a strange thing. And, yeah, I mean, certainly in, in Asia it happened, particularly in Italy. Italy... They ripped off everything under the sun, you know, and I love the Italian film industry as well. But they, you know, as soon as, you know, Romero made Dawn of the Dead, they were ripping that off. You know, I mean, Fulci himself ripped off Dawn of the Dead for Zombie, even though I I feel like that's got more originality than people give it credit for. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that was still in in itself a rip off of of Dawn of the Dead. That's why it was called Zombie 2 in Italy, because they tried to, you know, kind of pair it up to be a sequel of it. You know, there was a film that was released in Italy called Alien 2, which I think might have been Contamination. I don't I don't know, you know. I think they might be different. I, kn- right. I know what you mean, but I'm, mm. I'll, I'll need to look at that. I think Alien 2 is something different. But Is it different? But, but, you know, they go by so many different names. Maybe contamination has been called that at some point. Yeah, but even so, just the, the practice of that happening, it yeah. goes to show that people love their rip-offs. And it's a shame, I think, sometimes. But, look, it doesn't hurt the reputation of Alien. So... Yeah, no, a disappointing one, this. A disappointing, because I, I did think the first sort of 10, 15 minutes of it, it looked a bit promising. And then once all the lights get turned on, you realise, oh, OK, this is this is not quite doing it for me. But look, it's got a bunch of actors in it who I think, I mean, I did like Judy Geeson in it. I know you, you didn't feel the same. You've got Stephanie Beecham and then you've got a bunch of people in there who have gone on to do a lot of TV work. There are British actors there that have gone on to do all sorts of different work. So it's not like these people and not capable of acting. There just isn't no. a lot of character and, and charisma there, unfortunately. And the one thing about Alien, I hate to keep bringing it up, but look, that's the, the foremost comparison to make, is that you did like those characters. Yeah. Um, there was something there for you, and in this, it, it's, it's not so much. No, that's right. They were all distinct people in Alien, whereas these were just all actors turning up, getting a paycheck and going home again. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, fair enough. You've got to keep the lights on, haven't you? So release information, Thomas. Release mm. information, because I know you want a physical copy of this, dear boy. I know you want it. Well, let me tell you about it. DVDs were released in both the UK and the US, which are now out of print. Damn it, Tom. You're never going to no. get one. Uh, they seem to fetch elevated prices. I think on Amazon, one of them was shown for like £65. Don't pay £65 for this. Like, Don't, don't be doing that. Uh, the UK DVD was released by Stone Vision Entertainment. Um, who's Medusa in charge of that? Eh? <laughs> uh, Stone Vision. And the, you don't have to sympathy laugh, Tom. I know it wasn't good. It was awful. Thanks. The US DVD was released by your social taste in movies. The US DVD was released <laughs> by Elite Entertainment. No further releases see to be on the cards anytime soon. It's funny oh. because, you know, now, now, <laughs> come on now. Um, uh, uh, an hour ago, Norman J. Warren was your best mate. Now he's, now you're slagging him off the poor That was in the early, his early career. You know, it went right down the pan. <laughs> after <laughs> it did. After we praying. Didn't. Within four years, yeah. <laughs> he was uh, he was lost, which can't happen. So look, it happened to John Carpenter. John Carpenter made they live, and then went, it, the career went to shit for most of the rest <laughs> of it. So it can't happen. Um, yeah, so that's that. Now it is funny to me because Vinegar Syndrome are putting out the release of Prey. So I I wonder if 
if this will ever see a, a similar Blu-ray release. It's possible because this, you know, the version of this that we watched, it looked in better shape than Prey did. Oh, it did. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, who knows? I can only hope for all the fans out there of this movie that it does. You know, I don't begrudge anyone their enjoyment of it. If If people see it as a bit of campy fun or whatever, then more power to them. Fair enough. Right, Tom, you have fulfilled your function and now I am tired of speaking with you. So therefore, it is time to end this podcast. But I have enjoyed discussing these movies with you. We had a good old debate mm. on the uh, Prey, which is probably the, probably the most, the longest we've debated a movie for quite some time. We didn't do it angrily. This is the thing. We didn't do it angrily. We did it the right way. And uh, yeah, we got another strange and deadly show done because you know if you've been, you haven't sort of caught up with the news that's been happening with us, uh, we've been sort of focusing on our superhero podcast, haven't we? Which is Lost in the Omniverse, and we've been working on that. We've had a bit of a break, but we're coming back towards the end of January with a new episode of that. So Strange and the Deadly has sort of been by the wayside a little bit, but we're still thinking about it all the time. We are. You know, I, I love this show. I love the, the name, the brand, the whole thing about it. And we, we always like coming back to do it. And it's interesting. I think the Norman J. Warren film, The Terror, might be actually on the list. I'll have to Ooh. double check that. But So we might have round two or round three even. Uh, so <laughs> I can't we will see. We will see. But um, yeah, Strange and Deadly will return when that is. Who knows? But it will be. We're going to try and, and, and see what we can do to get as many of them knocked out. This I shouldn't say knocked out because every time I say that, Gore Blimey tweets me um, <laughs> and thinks that I'm talking about having a wank because uh, he's a dirty bleeder with his bloody chilies. Honestly. Yeah, we're not too sure, but we're going to try and, and record some more episodes this year because we're not actually that far away from finishing this podcast. We're or certainly finishing the the uh, run that we had in mind, which is the Section 3 list. I think we're about, Tom, you were saying it's something like seven or eight I think so, episodes, I think so. Something like that. And now, don't look, if you look at the running order on strangedeadly.com, uh, don't, because it's out of, it's out of whack now. We're, but what we're basically doing is choosing films that we feel we might like to cover to finish this out. I think we'll probably still end on the Dario Argento episode, because I think that would be quite a nice one for us yeah, to end yeah. on. Um, you know, because we're both Argento fans, certainly of his early stuff. Uh, but yeah, we will announce when another episode is coming and we're going to try and get some more done this year. So don't you worry, Strange and Dead is not going away and we've got, you know, we've got things in, in mind for how we're going to progress this thing. But if you want to listen to us on a more regular basis, every three weeks we put out an episode of Lost in the Omniverse and we're coming back with episode seven of that very soon. At the very beginning of this podcast, Tom said we're going to be discussing Iron Man 3 because we're starting off the uh, phase two of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which again comprises of six films there. And that will begin with Iron Man 3 and finish with Ant-Man at the very end of it. So that's quite exciting for us to do. If you would like to find us on social media, you can do so. Twitter.com forward slash the Chris Clayton. We also have a Facebook group, which is for uh, Lost in the Omniverse, which is Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Omniverse pod. We have a Twitter account for Lost in the Omniverse. That's Omniverse pod. Uh, we have a Twitter account for Strange and Deadly, which is uh, Twitter.com. I don't know why I keep saying Twitter.com, but at strange deadly no and in there just strange deadly tom where can they find your good self if they want to discuss with you the merits of of all this nonsense um you know what i i don't tweet anymore i can't be arsed with it i don't want to finish on yeah. a downer but don't <laughs> don't try and find me you'll only find me just hating social media you know <laughs> i'd rather live in the real world these days no look i'm not i'm not you know i'm not down on social media a lot of people like it but there's so much hate out there in the world that i prefer to just yeah. sit in my little office here with chris and talk about movies so <laughs> let's go go on the lost in the omniverse uh, group and i pop on there occasionally and have brief little chats um but that's probably the best way otherwise don't bother <laughs> yeah, and I, and I, <laughs> every time we record an episode or something, I say to Tom, "Do you want to tell him where your social media is at?" And he's like, "No, <laughs> just." Uh, and I, I mean, I'll admit it, Tom. I, I am down on social media. I don't oh, like shit, it much at it? all. It's shit. 
and you know it's just a vile place full of <laughs> negativity and people ex- you know you're allowed to express your opinions but you know you uh. post something positive and someone comes in and says something negative the only reason i'm on it is really is because there are a few people that i do like on there yeah, yeah and to promote the stuff that we do if i didn't have to do that i wouldn't be on there either <laughs> so yeah i know the world's got problems but i just don't need to be reminded of it four thousand times a day on social media so that you know <laughs> I'd rather be here talking to you directly, you know, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, but if you want to know the truth about me and Tom, we do spend an inordinate amount of time private messaging each other, discussing uh, the prices of media service <laughs> and uh, and how we can stream stuff digitally. So that's, so we're quite boring people anyway, so don't worry about yeah. it. Uh, thank you very much for listening and for checking out what we do. And thank you for supporting us. You know, I know it's difficult if you're a fan of Strange and Deadly and not a fan of superhero stuff to wait for these to come come along but i promise you we are thinking about them and about you and we will see you on the next one here on the strange and deadly show i've been chris clayton and i'm tom elliott and yeah we'll see you soon bye for now bye You've been listening to The Strange and Deadly Show. Music by Danny Davis. Artwork by Dark Inc. One. And presented by Chris Clayton and Tom Elliott. To listen to the back catalogue or to check out other shows on the network, please visit strangeanddeadly.com. We want to talk about Prey, and I'd like you to tell me about Prey, the first of our Norman J. Warren double bill. Tell me about Prey, Tom. I want to hear about Prey. I would be delighted to. Prey. Thank you. Really <laughs> released in 1977. Also. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Hold on. <clears throat> oh, no, oh, don't do this to me, you fucker. Hold on. <laughs> <clears throat> and we will see you on the next one here on the strange and deadly show i've been chris clayton and i'm tom elliott and um yeah bye <laughs> say it in a better way than that <coughs> and yeah thank you no thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay so we'll do a clap so after three three two one